All right. Greetings, everyone, from my uh, house in Connecticut. Um, I was actually at a hotel in Massachusetts yesterday uh, before I um, presented live for a youth group there, um, something we haven't done much since COVID started. So glad to be home and glad to be able to share today. We are going to get right into our talk. We talk. We have a lot to cover. Um, and I'll ask them just to leave the slides up because I want you to have time to read them and look at them as they're going, a lot of them are going to be pretty um, content rich um, as we get into this on a Sunday morning. Um, so let's read our scripture reading for the morning. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Our message, uh, marking the mind, the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, just make me a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us, we ask to hear a word of instruction from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's get into this. Um, we're going to go to Mark chapter 5 and start at verse 1. The Bible says, and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So here's a guy who is so, um, so um, demon-possessed, that he literally lives in the in the cemetery. He's filled with an unclean spirit. The Bible here says an unclean spirit. We find out later on that there are many unclean spirits. Uh, he dwelt among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So they tried to tie him up. He terrorized the area clearly because they wanted to tie him up. Verse 4, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. He was like, he had like supernatural strength. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. So here he is, you know, cutting himself, something that I see in my practice as a physician. I see more and more young people who are cutting themselves. He cutting himself, um, and he would break the chains to pieces. Verse 6, but when he saw Jesus far off, the Bible says he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion. For we are many. This is the crazy part of the story. The demon, when he sees Jesus, runs and falls and worships him. And, and clearly there's a battle in this man's mind where the man knows kind of probably what's going on, but is not in control of himself. He falls down and begins to worship Jesus, something that um, even the, 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 the many of the Jews did not understand that Jesus was worthy of worship. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? He says, I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. And Jesus says to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then Jesus says, what's your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. This group of demons seem to run in a pack. And Jesus in verse 10, and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. And so the demons wanted to stay local. Um, and there was a, um, nigh the mountain, near the mountain, a great herd of swine feeding and all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith 
Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So it makes you think maybe there were 2,000 demons. So all of these pigs get the demons. They go running down a steep incline, fall into the ocean, and begin to drown. Verse 14, and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. The Bible says, and they were afraid. When they saw this man who once broke chains and uh, cut himself and lived among the tombs and terrorized the neighborhood, sitting there clothed in his right mind with Jesus, they were afraid. They were afraid. You'd think they would be happy for the man, but they were afraid because they couldn't understand what actually was happening. Ellen White says this in The Desire of Ages, page 341. The encounter with the demoniacs of Gergesa had a lesson for the disciples. It showed the depths of degradation to which Satan is seeking to drag the whole human race and the mission of Christ to set men free from his power. Those wretched beings dwelling in the place of graves, possessed by demons, in bondage to uncontrolled passions and loathsome lusts, represent what humanity would become if given up to satanic jurisdiction. If, if Satan had full control over man, this is what men would look like. Satan's influence is constantly exerted upon men to distract the senses, control the mind for evil, and incite violence and crime. He weakens the body, darkens the intellect, and debases the soul. Whenever men reject the Savior's invitation, watch this, church. Whenever men re reject the Savior's invitation, they are yielding themselves to Satan. Whenever men reject the Savior's invitation, they are yielding themselves to Satan. Those who reject that God, what God is offering, the call of Christ on their hearts, they actually yield themselves to Satan. Through his specious temptations, Satan leads men to worse and worse evils, till utter depravity and ruin are the result. The only safeguard against his power is found in the presence of Jesus. His spirit will develop in man all that will ennoble the character and dignify the nature. It will build man up for the glory of God in body and soul and spirit. He has called us uh, the, to the obtaining of the glory, character of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, he has called us to be conformed to the image of of his son. And you get that from 2 Thessalonians 2.14, Romans 8.29, and you can find the whole passage in the Desire of Ages, page 341. So we see these, the, 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 this demon-possessed man um, in Gargessa, and he's chained and he's bound, and he's bound spiritually by these demons. And so the question for today is, how are men's minds chained today? What is binding men today. Um, it's prophesied, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 1 through 5 says, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. What kind of things will be influencing men's minds? The Bible says in verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So one of the big things is addiction. That's one of the things that binds men up. And the, the, the quote I use for that, God made the human heart so big, only he can fill it. And I learned this when I was working <clears throat> in addiction medicine at the Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda, California. And one of the recovering um, drug addicts uh, said, it led a chant in a group um, that said, God made the human heart so big, only he can fill it. I said, what do you mean? Each one of us has a God-sized hole in our heart. 
you try and fill that hole with cocaine, speed, heroin, um, alcohol, uh, marijuana, sex, pornography, uh, gambling, you're going to become addicted to that thing. Because it's never going to fill the hole you have that only God can fill. So addiction is one of the ways that the devil does that. And one of the first things is alcohol. So what does the Bible say about alcohol? Because I, I'm sure for you guys in, that are in Canada, um, it's very similar to here in the States where alcohol is very highly promoted. Almost every third commercial, it seems like on television, is an alcohol commercial, especially during sports venues. Um, there are billboards up with alcohol uh, in the United States advertising alcohol. Uh, interestingly enough, in, in, in inner city neighborhoods that are predominantly black and brown, the even malt liquor um, is is uh, advertised, so uh, or in traditionally has been. So alcohol is ubiquitous. In fact, many people say, well, the Bible says a little wine for the stomach's sake. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Um, and so they try and justify the use of alcohol. But here's what the Bible says, most specifically on the topic of alcohol. Proverbs 23, 31 and 32 says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gives his color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. At the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like an adder. What verse 31 is describing, young people, church, is that it is describing the process of fermentation. Did you get that? It is describing the process of fermentation. So what the Bible says is that when the wine gets red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself right after it is fermented, you shouldn't even look at it. Why? Because it bites like a serpent. How do serpents bite? They sneak up on you. And then they're deadly. Um, it stings like an adder. Verse 33 of Proverbs 23 says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall be shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. The Bible says that when you start to drink alcohol, your eyes will behold strange women. And what that's really speaking to is that you will not have the discernment to understand the character of the man or woman that you are going after. Um, this is a situation where literally you, you get people get drunk and they wind up sleeping with people that normally they would never even speak to. You behold strange women. Your heart shall utter perverse things. That means you start talking all kinds of foolishness. And it says that you, you uh, thou shalt be as the he that lieth down in the mast of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. In other words, rocking and rolling like a ship. You'll say they stricken me, they hit me, they beat me. Um, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and I felt it not. Um, and then it says, um, uh, uh, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Isn't that incredible? So even after all of that, even after all of that, you go back and get it. And that is the definition of addiction. Addiction says, even with all the consequences that comes, you still go back to doing that thing. The Bible, and I want you to get this clearly, the Bible forbids the use of fermented um, drinks or intoxicants, alcohol. And even though the world is lying to us, so what does the world say? Well, in America, there's a big thing, a glass of wine a day is good for you. Well, the studies show, the scientific studies show that if a woman drinks just one um, alcoholic beverage a day, like a cup of, like a glass of wine, she increases her risk of breast cancer. The studies also show, just came out, CNN just put this out like two days ago, um, that um, even one drink of alcohol is enough, um, Just even just one drink of alcohol is enough to um, permanently damage the brain. And I see this in my practice and even in my family where people have begun to drink alcohol and it, it, it creates damage. Um, we were on with some neurologists Friday night for one of our programs that we do, Slave Food Project. You can find it at Slave Food Project on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. The neurologist on there, we talked a bit about even how alcohol can increase the risk of dementia. But no one talks about this. 
obviously driving under the influence is deadly. Obviously, it causes liver disease, and I, I can show you some of that, right? Um, it, it causes all of these different problems, damage to the brain that we now know is permanent, and it's dose-related. So even if you just drink a little bit of alcohol, every time you drink it, you damage your brain a little bit. Chronic heart failure kidney failure, and cirrhosis of the liver. Um, the amount of deaths caused by alcohol uh, has gone up. That study doesn't come out well, but here it is. Study finds alcohol dampens brain waves associated with decision, but not but, um, decision making, but not motor control. So your ability to make decisions. Why is this relevant? Because to be a Christian, Christianity is all about a decision. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, you shall be as white as, as you shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. You've got to be able to make a decision. Now, here's what the Wall Street Journal says about the other big thing that is being legalized all over the United States, and I believe Canada as well. Marijuana. Now, this is the Wall Street Journal. Remember, this is not a Christian paper. Let's just be clear. Not a Christian paper. Here it is. Marijuana is more dangerous than you think. As legalization spreads, more Americans are becoming heavy users of cannabis despite its links to violence and mental illness. Really, no one is telling us about this. When Sanjay Gupta, the brilliant neurosurgeon that, that is um, 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 one of the pundits on CNN, did a special on marijuana, they didn't really focus on this very much. Why? Well, here's what the science is saying. Chronic marijuana use and higher dosages are found to correlate to greater incidence of, of psychosis and schizophrenia. In fact, there's a movement now here that says marijuana-induced psychosis is real. Um, the science proves that people must know the risks. So we have this short-term psychosis. And we had a there was a case that um, people have talked about in the States where a young man um, from a more rural part of the United States before, before uh, right when Colorado first legalized marijuana, he, he went on like a weed vacation, marijuana vacation to Colorado, bought a big marijuana brownie, and um, the guy told him, look, you can eat like fourths of it, one fourth of it at a time, space it out over six or eight hours or whatever he told him. Um, but the guy ate the whole brownie at once once he got back to his hotel room. He went into an acute psychotic uh, episode and wound up jumping to his death from his hotel room. This is real. And I've seen this in patients where they begin to lose cognitive function. And, other, and from those of you who don't know, schizophrenia is one of the worst um, uh, mental illnesses you can get in terms of its impact on you and on your family. Um, and one of the things people know about marijuana is that it makes you paranoid. Well, the hallmark of schizophrenia, one of the hallmarks um, in one of the forms of schizophrenia is uh, paranoia. But you get so paranoid that you can't function or live. And I've, I've had relatives who've suffered with this. And they walk into a room and they say, okay, where are the bugs? They're listening to us. You know, the aliens are under the chair. You become so paranoid, it becomes unrealistic. Nobody's talking about these dangers that come along with this drug. This point is particularly significant due to the increases in drug potency over the last two decades, while the average uh, potency has risen from 3% THC, um, uh, uh, ingredient in marijuana a couple of decades ago it is 9% now, with some measuring as high as 25%. So what's happened? The marijuana is being genetically modified. It's being bred to be stronger. People want the THC content to be higher. Why? So that people buy more, right? Now that you've got it legal and you're competing, you want the strongest, most potent stuff. Obviously, drug dealers wanted that 30 years ago. But now in a capitalistic, organized fashion, you can try and really make this so that it is incredibly potent. And it can and it can have its you know set of it can do what it does, um, which is addict. Um, and people say marijuana is not addicting. It may not be as addicting as cocaine or heroin, but it is definitely addicting. And marijuana works differently. So other drugs work on the presynaptic part of the nerve. And let's just use this as dopamine. I'll show you a slide about dopamine in a second. Marijuana works on the back end, on the dopamine receptors. And this is this one's showing you THC cannabinoid receptors. But I'll show you for dopamine in a second. The reason that's important is that when these receptors for dopamine, dopamine is the chemical in the brain um, that gives you, um, the, uh, dopamine is the chemical in the brain that gives you euphoria and pleasure. 
right? And so if you if you change the way the receptors are here are, are felt here, I've heard, I've had people uh, experts in this talk talk on this. What they say is that that's one of the reasons why marijuana can become a gateway drug, because when these receptors change, there's a lot more um, pleasure that comes from the next drug that you try, and that's part of the reason that marijuana is probably a gateway drug. Um, and of course, you have 130 plus deaths every day in the United States from opioids, um, which are highly addicting. And uh, of course, the drug abuse, this is what I was talking about earlier. You know, so when you eat food, somebody put in the chat is sugar addicting. Sugar can totally be addicting, but not just sugar. Sugar, fat, and salt mixed together. Michael Moss's book. Um, but it all uses the same pathways, all, use, all working to, to control people, but nothing like what cocaine does. You see all of the dopamine released, all the orange balls? That all translates into pleasure and all translates into a high that people then want over and over and over and over again to the point where when you give cocaine to rats, rats will starve themselves to death. If they can hit the lever that keeps releasing the cocaine, they'll starve from food, sex. They'll give up on all that stuff because cocaine gives them so much more dopamine. And here's the danger. The younger you begin to use these things, the more they impact the brain that is malleable and pliable. And so when we have kids being exposed to marijuana and alcohol at a young age, that's very dangerous. Here's what Ellen White says. She says that man is contending with foes who are stronger than he. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. When, so a lot of young people think, well, I can control this. I can try marijuana and alcohol. Listen, no alcoholic became an alcoholic on their first drink, probably not even on their 10th drink. But the Satan will leave you there. Have you drink socially for years, and then some tragedy hits your life, and alcohol is where you go for comfort instead of going to God or marijuana or cocaine or whatever it is. Isaiah asks the question this way, Isaiah 55 and verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. When you buy alcohol and marijuana and these things, for recreational uses, cocaine, ecstasy, um, crystal methamphetamines, you spend money on something that does not satisfy. As soon as you come down from the high, you want another high. You got to keep going back. So it doesn't really make sense. Ellen White says that Satan gathered his fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. One proposition after another was made, till finally Satan himself thought of, thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat, and other things given by God as food, and would convert them into poisons, which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers, and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. Under the influence of liquor, men would be led to commit uh, crimes of all kinds. Through perverted appetite, the world would be, would be made corrupt. By leading men to drink alcohol, Satan would cause them to descend lower and lower on the scale. Councils to the Church, page 101. Satan is, is, is taking the world captive through the use of liquor and tobacco, tea and coffee. The God-given mind, which should be kept clear, is perverted by the use of narcotics. The brain is no longer able to distinguish correctly. The enemy has control. Man has sold his reason for that which makes him mad. I like that line. Man has sold his reason for that which makes him mad. He has no sense of what is right. And Romans 8, 5 through 8 again says it like this. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, uh, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so... Your body, as one preacher said it once, Dr. James Kyle out in California, your body will conspire 
to kill you. It will conspire to kill you. If you get these addictions, the more cravings you have for these things, your, your body itself will crave the thing that will cause you to overdose, cause you to, 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 to be destroyed. You cannot live in the flesh. You must be must be spiritually minded. As the scripture says here, because to be spiritually minded is what? It's life. It's peace. So one of the other addictions I want to talk about is the addiction of pornography. Um, we're talking about character development in these two sessions. And so obviously uh, substances and chemicals like alcohol, cocaine, nicotine, caffeine even, all form habits and habits form character. One of the habits that is on the rise um, because of the cell phone and other things is pornography. And so we'll talk about that. <laughs> this study, again, these are not Christian uh, studies. This is from uh, one of the medical journals. It says, watching pornography rewires the brain to a more juvenile state. I want you to read the summary. We won't read, obviously be able to read the whole article. We'll give you a little more in a second, but it says, from eroding the prefrontal cortex, an area of the brain critical for impulse control, to damaging the dopamine reward system, researchers evaluate the impact of viewing pornography on the brain. You see what it does? Damages the dopamine reward system. That's what we were just talking about in drug addiction. But it also is important for, for uh, impulse control. And the prefrontal cortex, we'll talk about in a second as well. I think it's on the slide deck. Um, is This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. This is where character sits. This is where the seal of the living God will go or the mark of the beast can go here. It's very important. So when we talk about um, the prefrontal cortex, right, the, the frontal lobe right behind the forehead bone here, if it's being damaged, if it's being eroded, our ability to develop proper character is, is, is damaged, which is why um, when, when, when Paul in Ephesians 6 talks about the whole armor of God, it's the helmet of salvation, the helmet of salvation, because helmets protect the mind. mind. The mind is where salvation happens. So some more information. Porn may literally shrink the brain. A 2014 study in the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry found men who regularly consumed pornography had smaller brain volume and fewer connections in the striatum, a brain region tied to reward processing compared with those who didn't view porn. That's deep. Watching pornography literally changes the brain, changes the way you even um, um, experience pleasure going forward. You develop tolerance to pornography. So the more pornography you watch, the more you need, and then it has to get harder core, harder core. It has to get wilder and wilder, um, just like a drug. You know, you develop tolerance to cocaine or marijuana or alcohol. You develop tolerance here as well. And it teaches immediate gratification. One of the big problems with pornography, where a lot of young men in, in the United States and Canada are beginning to push back, is after being raised on devices like cell phones and iPads, um, they've realized now that uh, in that process um, of being so overly exposed and their brains marinated in pornography, that when they get older, they have a hard time having a good relationship with a wife. And because now the, the wife isn't what's on the screen, that's all fantasy. Um, and it, it's damaging a lot of marriages and, and, and inhibiting a lot of young men from having a good marriage. And Satan is so crafty. When you're 13, you don't realize when you're watching this stuff. When you're 35, what you watched 13 through 18, 19, and, and beyond could literally damage your ability to have a loving sexual relationship with the woman you committed your life to in marriage. And it's not just young men. Young women are also listening to and watching, I should say watching, pornographic material. I've, I've seen that when we've made altar calls at some youth groups here in the States. More and more young ladies are beginning to watch it. And we and the study's shown a lot on men, but what is this doing to young ladies as well? So for men, the hypothalamus also activates the testes to secrete testosterone, and SEM stands for sexually explicit materials. Sexually explicit material crafts a brain that is constantly generating testosterone and heightens sexual desire. Struthers, page, Struthers article from 2009 says, Instead of allowing boys to focus on school, sports, and music, sexually explicit material causes a ramped-up sex drive 
uh, where their minds were inundated with sexual thoughts. So it becomes a constant distractor for a young person, especially for young men from this study, uh, that you get harder to focus on school, harder to focus on other things, because this um, has, you know, you've overstimulated your sex drive, and now you can't focus on anything else. So some examples of this, and I've used these in sermons before, uh, Terry Crews, um, famous American um, actor, former National Football League player, he says this, and uh, pornography changes the way you think about people. People become objects. People become body parts. They become things to be used rather than people to be loved. Pornography is an intimacy killer. It kills all intimacy. Every time I watched it, I was walled off. It's like another brick that came between me and my wife. I didn't want to be this way. I didn't want to con continue to do things that hurt my wife, that hurt my family. And this is Terry Crews again, um, former NFL player. Uh, he, wor he works on uh, Brooklyn 99. I've never seen it, sitcom. But he's a Christian and a husband and a father. And so he has a book called How to Be a Better Man or Just Live With One. And he talks here about you know, how he needed to get rehabilitated from pornography um, and come back uh, to his wife and family in ho a whole person. But it's not just him. This is um, Russell Brand. And many of you might remember him. He, I don't know if he's still acting or not, but famous British, I think he's a British actor. And this is what he said about pornography. And remember, he's not a Christian. The other gentleman was a Christian. He's not a Christian. He says, I know that pornography is wrong. He says, I shouldn't be looking at it. There's a general feeling isn't there in your core if you look at pornography that this isn't what's the best thing for me to do. I feel like if I had a, had a total dominion over myself, I would never look at pornography again. One day at a time, I would, I would kick it out of my life. This whole cloud of pornographic information and often soft, soft cultural smog is making it impossible for us to relate to our own sexuality, our own psychology. So he talks about the damage it does. Um, he even talks about soft cultural smog, which um, I'm not sure if he's talking about the fact that even in regular movies that are not porn movies, the sex scenes are often very elaborate, very involved. Um, and so it can do a lot of what we're talking about pornography does as well. LOI says, I am instructed to say that in the future, great watchfulness will be needed. There is to be among men, among God's people, no spiritual stupidity. Evil spirits are actively engaged in seeking uh, to control the minds of human beings. Men are binding up in bundles, ready to be consumed by the fires of the last days. Those who discard Christ and his righteousness will accept the sophistry uh, that is flooding the world. The Christians are to be sober and vigilant, steadfastly resting, uh, steadfastly resisting their adversary, the devil, who's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Men under the influence of evil spirits will work miracles, she says. Now, here's where this gets deep. We are living in a time when a lot of this satanic stuff, I mean, we, there was this a big controversy of a guy named Lil Nas X, and, um, you know, I don't know all about it. I, you know, I know there was some some shoes, like named Satan shoes or something that he came out with in, in a music video um, that a lot of people uh, didn't like. Uh, but it's not just him. Even the stuff that we see, we talk about pornography, even all of this, the, the, the stripper culture that is getting big with, with artists like Cardi B and I don't know what, what Meg Thee Stallion's background is, but I saw, uh, you know, it was in the news here in the States that they did some performance at an award show that was, I guess it was controversial, very sexually, uh, strong sexual overtones, maybe super strong is the right word. Um and, and so now we, 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 we glamorize this stuff. Now, here's what's deep. Some of what they're doing is literally what was done in ancient Israel that led the men of Israel away from the camp, that led them into idolatry at places like Baal Peor. Um, and so these things are important to understand that we, don't, we, that we want purity of mind and heart. We want the character of Christ. Satan is working tirelessly against that. Um, we'll skip those. Subdue the carnal mind, reform the life, and the poor mortal frame will not be so idolized. If the heart is reformed, it will be seen in the outward appearance. If Christ be in us, the hope of glory, we shall discover such, such matchless charms in him that the soul 
will be enamored. It will cleave to him, choose to love him and in admiration of him, self will be forgotten. Jesus will be magnified and adored and self abased and humbled. But a profession without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality and heavy drudgery. Many of you may retain a notion of religion in the head and outside religion when the heart is not cleansed. God looks at the heart. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He will be satisfied with he will he will be satisfied with nothing but truth in the inward parts. Will he be satisfied with nothing but truth in the inward parts? Every truly converted soul will carry the unmistakable marks that the carnal mind is subdued. Powerful. So I'm gonna finish here and leave a few minutes for some questions just in case you have any. But um we're talking about character developing. There's certain things you just don't want to expose your brain to. Drugs, alcohol, um, pornography, gambling. You, you, you know, it, again, character is uh, what happens when a set, of, um, a set of habits come together to create a character. If you are not adding good habits to your life, of Bible study, of prayer, fellowship, of witnessing, those things aren't in your life. Just removing the old bad ones isn't going to be enough. In fact, moving the old ones may be impossible. In order to remove the bad habits and to really purify the character, we've got to be looking to Christ. Not looking to ourselves, not looking at our neighbors, but we've got to be looking at Christ. And that really is the most important thing, that Christ be the center of our lives, that he fills the God hole size, God hold size heart, that each hole in our heart that each one of us has. Christ must fill that void. And that is really where we are now. We must have the mind of Christ if we're going to make it in these last days. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And I just ask now, Lord, that you bless us and allow us, Lord, um, to have character growth, to have our characters purified, to understand, Lord, that you take our sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness and you remember them no more. So we're free from sin and free to grow our and develop our characters in you. And so, Lord, I ask that everyone on this call, that each one of us would take seriously um, the process of character growth, development, and character purification. Help us to this end, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks again. That meeting was awesome. That lecture was really dope. Um, one of the a question that um, one of the people asked is, uh, you mentioned the addiction of uh, marijuana, caffeine, pornography. Um, and this person asked, what about sugar? What yeah, I mentioned, I got to mention that in the talk. Sugar can definitely be addicting. Sugar chemically is not actually all that different from the, from the chemical um, structure of alcohol. Um, so sugar can be addicting, especially the way we process it. If it's attached to fiber, like in nature in, in fruits and stuff, it's not nearly, um, as addicting. Um, it's actually perfectly fine, but when we refine it, it, it actually is pretty potent. Thanks for asking that. Hey uh, guys, if you have any, any questions, uh, don't be shy to put them in the chat or if you want, you can come on stage and, uh, say them openly. Okay, so uh, Vladimir asks, um, what do you think about sports? Do you think practicing sports can hinder your character development? It can go either way with sports. Um, sports can be used. There's some, you know, in, in the inner city of America, um, sometimes sports for some kids who are having a hard time, uh, some kids can, um, you know, find a good coach. They learn discipline. They learn to work out and train. They learn teamwork. And so it can actually help their character. Now, but you have to be very careful. If sports gets too competitive or becomes too much of a distraction. It can actually be idolized and cause problems. So it just depends, um, you know, how the sports are used. Um, there's a lot of evidence we kind of like are totally against sports. 
Uh, but I, but the truth of the matter is, when you look at you know, in my own life, just watching kids in my neighborhood, sports saved a lot of those kids' lives, honestly, um, and did develop them into more honest um, and responsible adults than they would have been if they didn't have it. Uh, thank you, parents, for that. Guys, if you have any other questions, don't be shy. You don't mind if I ask you a question, right? Not at all. Oh, actually, before, um, <clears throat> Cedric uh, has a question. How long does it take to break a bad habit and build a new one? It's really a good question. It depends. Um, some people say like 21 days. I've heard people say that's not long, that's not long enough. It's more like six to eight weeks. But here's the secret. To breaking up, from, rather than time, think about process. To, to, you can't really truly break a bad habit. In other words, when you form a bad habit, there are pathways in the brain that are formed that are permanent. I think we mentioned that yesterday. What you have to do is create new habits that have a deeper groove, deeper, stronger pathways in the brain. Um, and that takes that can take time. Like I said, like at least like 21 days, some, some folks say. But the more you do it, the quicker you develop the, 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 the habit, right? So... So if you're trying to learn to play the piano and you want the habit of learning how to put your fingers where they go and learn how to play real well, but you only play the piano once a week, you may not ever get to get really good at playing the piano. Uh, but if you do, it's going to take a long time. But if you're practicing three times a day over seven or ten days, you actually could get pretty good I mean, if you, if you have a natural knack for it. So habits are the same way. It takes time to break one and it takes time to make one, but it has a lot to do with how much energy, how much you put into making the new habit or breaking the old one. Just to write off the question he just mentioned, um, could it, uh, could the amount of time it takes to, uh, to break a habit be highly influenced by the amount of time it took to build that habit? In some ways, yes, because that means that you may have more of a groove, a deeper groove for the habit. So if it's like a cigarette smoker, it's not just the addiction to nicotine, it's the habit of the hand mouth habit that they form too. You've been smoking for 20 years, a pack a day, 20 times a day you smoke, you know, it takes, you know, one cigarette. And how many times a day does you put the cigarette to your mouth? So you really got a deep groove there. And sometimes what we do is we'll say, well, instead of trying to just not do that, you know, we tell people to cut, when I worked in addiction medicine, cut straws the length of the cigarettes and pull on that to get over the nicotine addiction so that you just deal with the habit separately. Um, while you do the other things you got to do to break the nicotine habit, nicotine addiction. So it's really about um, finding ways to sometimes outsmart the habit um, so that you can create better new habits. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. Um, so here's a question I have. Uh, what about habits that aren't necessarily considered bad by, um, by I guess, your, uh, your friends or your family or, or people around you, um, but tend to take up the time that you would normally spend or that you could spend doing uh, things spiritually, you know, like, like doing a Bible study or something like that? Very good point. So, Let's say you have a habit of, you know, you have a pl habit of playing Sudoku, right? You know, just something, something innocent that actually works the brain, probably is good for cognitive development, long-term, might even protect you against dementia. But you play it seven hours a day. Well, it's now becoming an idol, in a sense. It's displacing you from doing other things that are important. Um, and so you got to be careful. And Sudoku is a weird example. But there are a lot of good things. I mean, there are a lot of church people who are so busy doing church work, they've got that habit down, they spend no time on their own knees 
in prayer or studying the Bible. Um, they're just working and not really growing in Christ. So you do have to be careful that that doesn't happen to you. Thanks for answering that. No problem. Uh, I got a question. It's uh, about the sc scheduling your, you know, your days every day. You know, sometimes you have a week like uh, every, you don't have time to, 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 to meditate. And how how can we like figure out a way to, you know, if we have a schedule like every day when you you have thing that takes place like uh, early in the morning you have to go to work because. And after that, when you come to, to when you come home, you're tired, you don't have you're not focused. So sometimes we we came with the it's like it's not like we force it, it's like it's become natural for us to you know we try to to, to, to manage time but we feel like time is not enough to to, to have a good devotion life. That's a good question, and it is, it is it is very important to have a good devotion life. Um, I don't know that it's really you know, it's, it's the foundation of your Christian walk. But here's here's what's important. What I tell people, and let me see if I have one of them here. I get um I get index cards, and you can probably I'm sure some of you guys are tech savvy that could do this with your phone or something. I get an index card, and what I do is I write on one side of it. Bible promises, and then I'll write on the other side of it a habit I want to break or a habit I want to form, and I use that. So, you know, a Bible promise might be 2 Timothy 1 7 for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. On the back, I write what I want to break. And what this does is you can start to create little micro devotionals. Also, I get like email, you know, I want for some um, uh, daily, the daily uh, scriptures, so they send you like a, a text. I have some that the LNG White Estate sends me, so I get a little daily reading. So no matter what throughout my day, I have to check my email. I'm always checking my email on my phone. So it, it forces me to, to do a little bit of studying. And this is good just to take with you so that you always have a way to open up, read the Bible, and, and have some spiritual experience in that, in, that, in that regard. Okay, so um, a question by Claudia. How important is it to have an accountability friend to have victory over addiction? Or do you think it's necessary? We talked, we were funny, we were talking about this before we got on um, the talk. It is actually critical. When Jesus sent them out, remember, the Bible says he sent them out by twos. Why? Have two people gives you not just safety, but accountability. Um, and so I do think having an accountability partner is very important. Um, and making sure that that person is connected to you um, and has your best interest at heart, someone that you can confide in when you're feeling weak and struggling with, with things. Um, so I think it's a very important thing. Is it 100% necessary? I'm sure, there are people that get our, can get away without it, but I think most of us, we need someone. And one day, you, you know, many of you guys are young, you get married, your spouse on some level should be an accountability partner, but you also need to have some folk outside of your marriage. Your best, as a guy, you know, I have, I have guy friends that are, really cool and we use each other as accountability partners on certain things in our lives. And I think that's really important. Uh, thanks for answering that. Uh, a question to go along with that. Um, one second. Um, so a question to go along with um with uh, Claudia's question is what about because I know a lot of friends who have accountability partners or they don't call it that but that's what it is um but of the opposite gender what's your thoughts on that you have to be careful if it's the opposite gender because obviously there's some things you probably don't want to be talking to with the opposite gender about so you know if you really are dealing with sexual issues a young lady you know or a young man is dealing with sexual um issues right? Do you really want to tell your guy friend, um, you know, <laughs> that this, this is what you're having? I mean, you know what I mean? You could, you could literally tempt him or vice versa. Let's not, you know, let's just be honest. If a guy is telling his friend who's a female, 
you know, that he's having struggles with sex and he's he's slipping and making mistakes. And she has a crush on him, you know, even though they're supposed to be, a, you know, friends and accountability. Um, very easily, obviously, something could happen. So you do have to be careful. I think for some things, um, it's good to have someone of the same sex that you trust um, as your accountability partner. But I think there's other things um, where, you know, if it's around, you know, diet and exercise, if it's around studying the Bible or even academic studying for school, um, having someone of the opposite, opposite gender may not be a problem. Right. So I guess to a degree, it depends on uh, what your struggles are and what you're, you're keeping each other accountable for. And you have to also be honest. Do you have feelings for that person? Right. So do you have an accountability partner that you have this big crush on that obviously can can um, be, be a problem for you in a sense, you know, that you are sharing secrets with someone and not necessarily letting them know how you feel or even because once you tell them that you feel that way, they really can't be an accountability partner if you're if you're someone you're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Claudia is, can therapy be a good way to overcome an ad addiction? I think therapy is, in most cases, necessary. It is not the only component. There are a lot of pieces to overcoming an addiction. But some people, some of us, uh, we do what we do because we're self-medicating. We've got traumas from childhood, traumas in our lives. And what we're doing, honestly, is just self-medicating. We're people taking smoking weed and drinking alcohol because they've got unresolved childhood pain, even sometimes adult pain. Uh, you know, someone goes through a terrible divorce. All of a sudden, they're drinking upticks. What are they doing? They're medicating themselves, trying to medicate the pain. Uh, so why there's so much opioid addiction, in my opinion? People have pains that they can't even verbalize sometimes. So a therapist is good to sit down, raise these issues to the surface, and help you to resolve them and heal from them. Ideally, you find a Christian counselor. I Somewhere around, I have a list of a couple you can use online in the United States. I don't know if they work from Canada. Um, but um, that's what you, ideally you would find. But therapy is actually a very good thing. No problem. I have a question for myself. Um, I, I think I think we'll conclude after this question if nobody else has any. Um, but I, I mentioned this a little bit before before, uh, before this started, and that is, um, I told you I did running, right? Uh, one thing that I really liked doing while running was praying. I found like running and praying when you match them together, um, and if you reach like the, the runner's high or runner's dimension, whatever it's called, um, I find that's like. That's an awesome, uh, I guess not devotion or Bible study, but like prayer time. Um, so what are your thoughts on, uh, excuse me, mixing prayer into, uh, I guess, like a solo physical activity? I think, you know, Paul says that we should pray without ceasing. We, and Ellen White says this means we should also always be in a, in a posture of prayer, always open to communicating with God. And sometimes you do need something, not distracting, but to be in a rhythm of life and doing something like running. For me, sometimes when I'm playing basketball, you know, not playing the game, but like just shooting hoops, I get these really good conversations with God as I'm just like shooting the ball around. And so I don't think there's clearly nothing wrong with that. Um, and for some people, it may really work good because to your point, the rush of adrenaline and endorphins may honestly help you to focus more um, on your prayer and actually get better in touch. Um, obviously you still need your simple prayer time in your room on your knees, but there's never a bad time to talk to God. And there's usually an advantage to doing it in any circumstance whatsoever. All right. That's, that's a good way to put it. Thanks. I think I see one person typing. I know I did too.
Did, I'm guessing you read the question. I did. Well, she's asking about what would you suggest for daydreaming that, that, can, that can also take away our time with God. Um, some people do have a harder time focusing and they daydream more easily. If it's really bad, you get tested, make sure you don't have like attention deficit disorder, um, you know, or, or something like that. Um, what I would say is, again, you know, if you're daydreaming or not, you need things in your life to help you refocus. And, you know, obviously we, we just talked about exercise is one way to do that. But I think things like the index cards and having set time to try and focus back on God and setting a time, setting time aside for God. If you're daydreaming a whole lot, that's something that you may want to try and figure out why you're doing that. If you're just in school and you daydream away an hour long class, everybody daydreams, but it should be limited. So sometimes you might actually want to talk to a therapist about as well. So this, uh, this next question is a little, uh, a little more difficult. Um, can the absence of a parent hinder your character development? If yes, how do you overcome it? Great question. And I would say yes, it can. Um, you know, if you, you know, you know, don't have, if, if you have two parents and one of them really would have been the one that would have been stronger and leading you to God and Christ and crack character development, you lose that one. It will hurt. It will hurt. If you don't get the right example because you lost a parent, that could, that, that could do it as well. Um, but on the flip side of it, you know, if you had a really terrible parent who was a heathen and would be uh, cursing and drinking and womanizing on your mother, for example, and you grow up with that. It actually might confuse you and, and, and leave you kind of straddling the fence about your Christianity. But in general, you know, uh, having um, a godly parents is actually very important. So it can hinder it from that perspective. How you overcome it is honestly like how you overcome any of these things. you got to spend a lot of time with God, a lot of time in the word, um, therapy, um, talk to the parent that you still have and make sure you have a good relationship with that person. Try and form a relationship with the person uh, who left if, if if someone actually left um so that's really really important um if you think about um you know you, you know um not having a parent uh, parents help set examples and that's good for character development but even without it having a good church family with good examples uh can help make up the difference so claudia is also asking you have a testimony to share of a person who that you know that overcame their addiction problem. I have a lot of these after working in addiction medicine and other things. There are a lot of people who actually do overcome completely from drug addiction, gambling addiction, pornography addiction, um, and, and are made whole. And, you know, the, the formula is actually pretty simple. One of them is that they have to become aware that this thing is a problem and that it's a moral problem in many cases. Come across that it's a problem. Secondly, realize that you're helpless to fix the problem by yourself. Third, find a community or support group um, to come and support you um, in that in that process. And then four, you know, work through um, all of the healing you'd get from like a therapist and so forth, along with all the other things you can do for addiction treatment, things like AA and so forth. So um, I have a lot of people. I mean, I'm I, you know I give a testimony all the time about. One man I met at the VA hospital who wound up giving his life to Christ right there on the floor in the hospital and never and saying, you know, when I saw him again, saying he had no more desire for drugs at all after that. Once he had come to grips with some of the pain and trials that he'd gone through in his life, you know, he not, you know, he was able to move on in Christ for a lot of reasons. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. I can't get into them all now, but a lot of stories where people stopped doing something addictive and moved on with their lives. All right, well, I think I think that's all the questions. Um, if you guys do have one, type it really quick. Because if not, I think we're gonna then we're gonna conclude here. Again, thank you so much for showing up, for being here with us today, and asking uh, some really good questions. To be honest, um, as well as Dr. Eric Walsh for uh, leading out this presentation and giving a lot of really good information, valuable and practical that we can we can put into our uh, our day to day life today and tomorrow. You know, so. Um, Again, thank you guys for showing up. Thank you guys for being here, for making this more awesome.